Hello, I'm Courtney Duncan, and I'm pleased to have been invited by the Open Research Institute Space and Satellite Symposium to share a few thoughts on the role of amateur radio in practicing and advancing the state of the art in radio communications. I've been a licensed radio amateur, call sign N5BF, for nearly 50 years, and I'm just concluding a 45 year professional career uh, spanning broadcasting, embedded software, radio, and radio navigation technology. Most of that at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology. I'm also a past official of AMSAT North America and of several amateur radio clubs over the years. And I'm currently president of the San Bernardino Microwave Society, a Southern California group of technologically advanced radio amateurs who have been dedicated to the advancement of communication above 1000 megacycles since 1955. So what are the distinctives of amateur radio in the larger and increasingly all permeating world of wireless communication? For many radio amateurs, the communications technology is not just a black box for some end purpose. Hams are interested in all aspects of the technology itself, from power sources to digital control and processing systems, to mixing and amplification to electromagnetic transducers, that is antennas, to electromagnetic fields and their propagation properties. Amateur radio is a non-commercial by definition, but radio amateurs are licensed to operate on a broad range of different bands from a few hundred kilohertz uh, to microwaves to lasers and are therefore exposed to broad spectrum of variation in propagation equipment and usage. It's worth pointing out that this is relatively unique within the practice of radio. If ra radio amateurs want to create a satellite based communication system with uplinks in their 5.8 gigahertz and downlinks in their 10 gigahertz bands or any of the other many bands authorized for amateur satellite use, the process of licensing and coordinating is relatively straightforward. Amateurs can and have put satellites on 7 megahertz, 29 megahertz, 144 megahertz, and 1.26 gigahertz, for example. Uh, amateur radio contains many diverse subcommunities and therefore styles and motivations of uh, operation and experimentation. Among the experimenters, it is usually more important to develop approaches and technologies that work over challenging and challenging is usually defined as long distance paths at all, rather than deliver a certain volume of low latency bandwidth for revenue. This allows for trials, sub-optimization, and even failures, leading, leading to improvements without the risk of commercially unacceptable consequences. Even though one of many features of amateur radio is low bandwidth, unreliable communication to destinations chosen largely at random, by, for instance, the propagation medium. Even these properties have led to some interesting and useful capabilities, which are often picked up by the broader communication community. In favor of the amateur approach to technology development is this great diversity of purpose and the very ability to take long shot risks. Amateurs have demonstrated a remarkable capacity for adopting, improving, and imaginatively repurposing the technologies and resources that are available to them. Historically, radio amateurs have used modulation techniques to send information by voice and Morse code using on-off keying, a technology pioneered in the 19th century, when all the brains of a communication system were the human brains involved. Amateurs refer to this use of on-off keying as CW for a continuous wave. These nominally fit into bandwidths of about three kilohertz and, and 400 hertz respectively, where the lower bandwidth CW link can be closed with 10 to 15 dB more reliability or equivalently five to seven dB more distance, other things being the same, at the cost of 10 to 15 dB of reduced information rate. Amateurs who attempt this over the most challenging paths are called weak signal operators because they're trying to recover information from a low or marginal signal to noise ratio in a, clear, in a cleverly devised 
machine brain collaboration. At the dawn of the 21st century, a team of software developers led by Nobel laureate uh, Joe Taylor, K1JT, began development of a set of modulation techniques tailored to a certain amateur radio communication situation that uses the popular three kilohertz bandwidth channels supported by lots of amateur equipment to much greater effectiveness by subdividing these passbands into subbands of a few hertz each using digital signal processing to optimize modulation and demodulation, protocols that optimize compression of required data, and using forward error correcting codes to recover and reconstruct lost information. These modes can recover information 30 dB or more below the signal to noise ratio normally needed for single sideband voice communication, and therefore enable existing stations to communicate much further or in much deteriorated conditions, or more commonly uh, for much smaller stations to communicate at all. So this is my 23 centimeter Earth Moon Earth station at my home. It features a 3.8 meter dish steerable in two dimensions, 250 watt power at the antenna feed and on receive a low noise amplifier with a noise figure of about a quarter of a dB. The station can be and is used for direct communication line of sight with other stations in the region, but its design intent is to transmit signals focused on the moon have them scattered by the moon and detect the weak signal returns back on Earth, a process that at 23 centimeter wavelength uh, suffers about 291 dB of loss. Now here you see uh, behind me uh, the indoor parts of this station. I'm giving this uh, presentation from my ham shack. And you see here the uh, 23 centimeter power amplifier the antenna controls, um, the intermediate frequency radio, the transverter, and even the Morse code um, uh, straight key here, and the computer that's used to uh, manage all of this. A station like this is just barely able to work another just like it with difficulty on CW, low bandwidth Morse code with a skilled operator. Voice communication is only possible when partnered with another much larger station, such as a 10 meter dish running 1000 watts. Using the K1JT digital modes, however, I'm able to easily work those stations plus others that are much smaller down to around one meter dish or equivalent Yagis in size and 100 watts. This, as you might imagine, makes the worldwide community, uh, community of EME operators much larger, at present a few thousand, some 500 or so of which are known to be active on or at least equipped for 23 centimeters. The larger stations that can be worked in the traditional ways are limited to just a handful. Work on the JT modes continues and the ability to trade data rate for weaker signal recovery can go on as long as human operator patients can tolerate, perhaps another 10 dB or more. Successful contacts currently take a few minutes to a few tens of minutes. When they get to where they take a few hours, other limitations, not just the physics of radio itself, will apply. Within the confines of the requirements of weak signal radio operators, astounding progress has been made in optimizing very powerful modulations, codes, and protocols for information recovery. One can imagine similar efforts at different bandwidths driven by other requirements with similar success. <clears throat> the stereotype of amateur radio is that it is mostly shortwave, that is, wavelengths of tens of meters and antennas of corresponding size. As these waves are refracted back to earth by the ionosphere, worldwide communication, yes, that is unreliable, low bandwidth to destinations chosen largely at random, is supported under some conditions which are analyzed and predicted thoroughly just like the weather. At shorter wavelengths just above the short waves, up to about a thousand megahertz, ham amateurs have our share allocations in the highly popular VHF and UHF regions that are used for local uh, near line of sight communication. Uh, 
Indeed, however, uh, amateurs have access to and make significant use of allocations mostly shared with others via highly orchestrated cooperation agreements or regulations from 0.9 to 300 gigahertz and all above 300 gigahertz, as you can see here. Sometimes hams are the professionals who are implementing systems for very exciting applications, such as the recent Mars helicopter Ingenuity, which is partnered with the latest Mars rover Perseverance, doing investigations on Mars right now. Due to the very thin air on Mars, the helicopter had to be as light as possible, and the designers would have liked nothing better than a communication system that had zero mass. As it was, we were able to deliver a system at 13.3 grams, which was acceptable, and had a target operating range of up to one kilometer. This was done by repurposing a $60 commercial Zigbee part intended for home uh, automation applications, hardening up the hardware for the Martian and cruise to Mars environments, and hacking the embedded code to meet the peculiar requirements of the rover to helicopter link on Mars. Several radio amateurs were on the helicopter team, including the original designer, the late Eric Archer, N6CV, and the team lead, yours truly, N5BF. So here's the $60 Zigbee part used on both Ingenuity and Perseverance to implement the communication link. It's a small system on a module that weighs 3.3 grams on Earth after we were finished modifying it. The proprietary offshoot of Zigbee was implemented in the part family as delivered, and this is a 1 watt 914 megahertz SOM with the capability for diversity reception. We used the tools supplied online by the vendor to modify the code to create our own custom version of the MAC, that is Medium Access Control 802.15.4 protocol layer to our own requirements. Requirements such as the need for the helicopter to maintain radio silence and for the rover base station to control the link at all times. The physical layer was not modified. All transmissions are single packets with their own synchronization and they have payloads up to about a thousand bits each. The part supports over the air data rates of 20 and 250 kilobits per second and an undocumented and unused 1,000 kilobits per second. And we package these into various operating modes for use on the system. Effective throughput is somewhat lower than over the air bit rate owing to the packet construction and protocol overhead, such as AX, NAX, retries, and so forth. We lab tested these parts extensively to determine the weak signal operating threshold in various modes versus the reported parameters in telemetry. In practice, we guaranteed uh, 20 kilobits per second down to minus 105 dBm and 250 kilobits per second down to minus 95 dBm. Although you can see here that some of the parts would do better than that at some temperatures. Also, the ability uh, to use retries increases the recovery rate near the cliffs of the performance edges. This information was used along with data about the terrain and relative vehicle orientations with respect to the antennas to predict and analyze link performance on Mars. We also analyzed parts performance as modified by us in both hardware and software in the presence of various kinds of interference and found them to be robust. The physical layer utilizes a spread, spread spectrum resulting in a, uh, a coding gain of 11.5 dB and a bandwidth of 600 uh, or uh, kilohertz or two megahertz in the channel, depending on the over the air data rate. Now, this leads to resilience in the presence of nearby tone or adjacent channel interference of any kind. Now this is a plot of the sort that we use to analyze flight performance of the telecom system. Right to left is the timeline beginning with the first communication of the soul or day on Mars and proceeding through pre-flight and flight and then post landing and data file recovery. The parameter of interest to me is the green line at the bottom, which maps directly into received signal level. 
You can see the signal improve when the helicopter is airborne, varying as it flies along through the rover uh, antenna azimuth pattern, sometimes changing orientation itself, and then go make, going back down on landing to a slightly lower level at its new ground location. This flight path was 630 meters over hazardous terrain, and the beginning and ending points were several hundred meters from the rover. The landed signal level shows here is about minus 85 dBm, which leaves about 10 dB margin at the data rate being used. The blue line is the one of interest to the customer, the amount of data transferred per unit time. In-flight telemetry is throttled to about 55 kilobits per second so as not to bump the limits of the 80 kilobit per second effective throughput link, but you can see peaks near that level in the file transfers at the end. The orange line is a link quality indicator, which is not particularly meaningful in this particular mode, but no data was dropped, lost, skipped, or necked in this session. And just for fun, this is one of my favorite aerial photos from the helicopter mission. It shows ground tracks of the rover that closely match the history given in the public uh, website online shown to the right. You can also see the airborne helicopter landing gear and shadow in the photos. This was made by the return to earth camera, which is pointed down 45 degrees from horizontal or up 45 degrees from nadir as you prefer, so as to get interesting hybrid views. Another camera pointing straight down was used in the loop as part of the in-flight navigation algorithm. I show the Mars helicopter material as an example of a professional application of the broad amateur radio mindset. Not only was an impressive task accomplished with an expensive off-the-shelf part and protocol, but it was extended and amended as appropriate to the task at hand by engineers who had firsthand knowledge of practical ways to achieve the goal. To radio amateurs, a communication system is not a mathematical abstraction. It is a visceral reality for which they have well-developed seat-of-the-pants instincts. Engineers with extensive amateur radio avocational experience were chosen for this particular job for that reason. So looking forward into the large, larger worldwide telecommunications community and industry, Amateur radio continues to make significant contributions and remains relevant into the second century. Those of us who are experimenters and builders sometimes need to be reminded to get on the air in as much as occupancy of our assigned portions of the spectrum constitutes part of the justification for continued access. It's also necessary for us, like all science and technology developers, to get the word out there by publishing and participating in conferences like this. And of course, we must all cooperate and coordinate with each other within the avocation to keep it relevant and vibrant. Hams are busy doing all these things as we speak. Thanks for your attention. I can be contacted at the email shown here.